Okay, uh, welcome to the last session of this uh, workshop on geothermal energy. Uh, there is an announcement, uh, Dr. Ahmed asked me to announce, and that is that there, is, there will be a quiz uh, next week, sometimes on the Google course, where uh, you guys will see the questions. And uh, I assume uh, if you pass, he's going to issue a certificate for this workshop for you guys. That was a, just a quick uh, announcement uh, from Dr. Ahmad. And uh, coming back to our discussion of the geothermal energies, uh, today we are going to go over the discussion of the analysis of the geothermal deep direct use uh, combined with the reservoir uh, thermal energy storage on West Virginia University campus. Uh, this is the project that uh, we are currently uh, pursuing and uh, this involves uh, different entities uh, supported by the DOE and uh, operated by Northeast Natural Energy uh, in Morgantown, West Virginia. So uh, the, the picture that you're seeing is the, uh, is the path that, uh, that the well has been drilled uh, this pad, we have been using this pad before for another uh, DOE supported project uh, called uh, MCL, which stands for Marcellus Shale Energy and uh, Environmental Laboratory. Uh, there is a website for this, which is uh, www.mcl.org. in which if you go, you, you will be able to get access to all the information uh, regarding this pad. Uh, there are multiple wells drilled. I'll go over those discussions, but uh, all the information from the logging, coring, drilling data, seismic, fiber optics, they're all available. So, and it's open to the public. So you can go and uh, check that. So this is a project uh, that we are going to discuss today. So uh, this is a hot dry rock. And what we are going to do is to try to see if it's possible to extract the heat and use for the uh, heating and cooling of the West Virginia University campus. Uh, there are multiple projects, a student projects uh, has been going on uh, involved with this data. One is the DOE Geothermal Colligate uh, Competition 2023, which uh, most of these presentation uh, slides is coming from uh, what uh, students provided for this uh, competition. And uh, again, this is a good opportunity. Uh, DOE initiates this uh, every year. So uh, you can have a good chance of uh, attending this uh, competition. It's probably next year. We had another competition with the Switch International uh, Switch Energy. Again, that's an international uh, competition, uh, which basically our team from WVU was uh, looking at the geothermal, mainly uh, resources in Kenya and uh, Indonesia. And uh, they were investigating the possibility of how to develop that, which is again, that's a, that's a very good platform uh, for students. If you are, in, if you are interested, uh, I recommend you to look for Switch Energy International competition. And uh, basically you can uh, come up with a plan. And this is mainly on the energy transition and bringing the countries uh, which are under the energy poverty out of the energy poverty. How, what do you think, how it would be the way to go? So uh, just a quick background on those. The outline of this uh, would be again, uh, we are looking at the geothermal energy in West Virginia University, specifically in the Appalachian Basin. Uh, we look at the project overview. Uh, this work has been divided in different uh, sections. We are looking at the surface characterization and subsurface characterization and then heat reservoir using the modeling and at the end financial analysis and the conclusion. 
So uh, here at the top, uh, basically what you're looking is the uh, is a basin, uh, basins with the sedimentary rocks deeper than 15,000 feet. That's a map of these sedimentary rocks in the US. So in the East Coast, as you can see, this is where uh, we are located, the Appalachian Basin. And uh, here is where Western Virginia is. And uh, this map actually shows that we have a good deep uh, sedimentary rock uh, with the which can be used for this uh, geothermal. And if you remember from our previous discussions, we also showed that uh, the temperature gradient in this area is actually anomaly and it's much higher than the surrounding area. So again, shows that it's a good place to explore the opportunity of using the enhanced geothermal systems. Uh, this map at the bottom shows the all the oil and gas wells in West Virginia. And as you can see, there are lots of gas and the oil wells uh, drilled, which basically brings another opportunity for us because uh, there are so many wells uh, from the, uh, which already been drilled and completed to the certain depths that can be used. In, in the depleted oil and gas reservoirs that, that can be used for uh, repurposing and using that for the uh, geothermal resources. This can uh, significantly reduce the capital expenditures for this, uh, for this project. So in that sense, this, all, this is also a very good opportunity. And if you remember, uh, we were discussing the SAGE program uh, last session and uh, in that program we said that the sage they, they acquired one of those uh wells uh depleted wells and then they work on that well made it deeper and performed experiments so again this is a good way of uh, breaking that uh, capital cost uh, some uh, highlights uh, on the west virginia uh, population around one point 9 million in 2021. Uh, the GDP of uh, more than $95 uh, billion. Per capita, personal income around 50,000. And total consumption of energy uh, in 2021 was 854 trillion BTU. Okay. And total expenditure of 8.7, 8,000. $754 million. So this basically gives you an overview of what kind of environment where we are uh, working, what kind of energy consumption, what kind of uh, expenditures they had. And uh, this gives us a good understanding of the location. The, the other thing that we are going to investigate when we are talking about these direct uh, use of the uh, drug rocks, or enhanced geothermal systems is basically the end users, where we wanna use that. And this specific project, we are using that to heat and cool the Morgantown campus of West Virginia, which is basically spread across 1,892 acres and consists of about 245 buildings. So uh, we divided this into five different uh, distribution points. One would be on a downtown distribution points here, right here in A. One would be on a life sciences distribution point on point B. The other one would be on the agricultural distribution point or Evansdale campus, that would be point G. We have tower distribution points on the H and we have the J, which is basically the health sciences. So this is basically showing that where those uh, locations for the heat distribution will look like. And this is basically the line trend of the whole system. The well has been already drilled on the other side. The science well is in the other side of this river. But uh, when it comes to the actual uh, operating and actual performing this uh, geothermal, then most probably the wells will be drilled to the same side uh, that the university campus is located. Uh, as I said, the first thing is uh, to investigate the need and investigate the amount of heat that we need at the surface 
and also the rate because that's that's basically it uh what eventually as an engineer you measure at the surface you just need to know how much rate and what temperature you can produce from that well and how do you come up with that rate and temperature basically you are looking at the consumption so this graph basically shows that the average steam flow rate measured uh, and uh, for for different buildings for the downtown life sciences agriculture tower medical centers and these are measured on a different month okay so they are measured at a different month and as we can see the amount of the heat flow required is uh, obviously different in the winter time we see the peak of the heat flow and in the summer time we have less heat consumption so this gives us a good understanding of uh, what flow rates that we need and when we are designing our well then we, we can find out that how many wells we need to drill and if it really well what would be the casing what would be the size of the wall that we need to to provide that amount of uh, heat flow and uh, energy that we are required this graph again this is showing that the energy consumption in uh, million btu per day and you know the btu stands for the british thermal, thermal unit and the, the steam flow is measured in pound per hour okay so pph stands for pound per hour mmbtu stands for million btu per day and again as you can see that the energy consumption is much higher during the winter time december january february these are the times that we have the peak of the uh demand so we need to be able to operate the well such that we can meet these demands and we should be able to have a storage that when we don't need that demand, we should be able to store the heat in the reservoir. So these are the things that we need to know from the surface facility, which basically looking at measuring that uh, heat flow and also the temperature requirements. For example, in most of these buildings, the, we are required to reach to that 180 degree uh, Fahrenheit of the temperature so we just wanted to make sure that if your if your downhole temperature is 250 degree fahrenheit with all the heat loss and the heat conversions you must have 180 degree fahrenheit at the surface and if you don't have uh, what is that uh, shortage and uh, how we can accommodate that using the heat pumps okay uh, the next thing that we wanted to do and we are investigating is the subsurface reservoir modeling. And uh, this is basically a representation of the dashboard uh, that Dr. Brian Panetta from the geology department, they, he, he provided. And this basically integrates uh, all the information that we have uh, at this uh, pad, at this MIP pad that we drilled our uh, geothermal well. And as you can see uh, in this uh, in this three D visualization, this is the on the left. This is the uh, field, and as you can see, there are multiple wells drilled. These horizontal wells, these are actually the wells that's been drilled in the Marcellus Shale, and we are using those to uh, produce gas. Actually, these wells are producing gas for the Morgantown. They are providers of the Morgantown usage of the gas and then this single well the deep well that you see which goes down to at this time to down to 10,500 this is the one this is the well that we intended to use to study the possibility of the uh, geothermal systems on the right hand side uh, you see the aerial view of these so this is these are the four horizontal wells drilled in the Marcellus shape for the production and then we have the uh, well, MIP-1S, which is the uh, geothermal well, which is a vertical well right here. So the vertical well is the MIP-1S geothermal, and then the other ones are the shale gas producers. The good thing about these wells are we already have uh, collected uh, 
good amount of information, geological information. We, we collected the different type of well logs, core samples, seismic informations, and uh, we could use all those to quantify the formation properties, both rock and fluid, all the way to the depth of uh, 8,000 feet, 7,800 feet, where these uh, wells are landed. And then from that point on, we investigated more on the deeper formations where we can explore the possibility of the heat reservoirs. All these dots, the blue dots that you can see here, these are basically the micro seismic events being collected during the stimulation of these wells. Another information that we have here is the fiber optics that has been ran through this uh, MIP3H. So again, that info, that fiber optics, which also continuously collects the temperature data and uh, acoustic information can be used for further evaluation and monitoring of the activities in this field. As I said, that well, this uh, website is uh, is available. Uh, this dashboard is available uh, through this link. So if you click on the link, you it basically takes you to the to the dashboard, uh, which is going to be. Uh, let me see if I can pull it up. Okay, uh, can you guys see the the dashboard? If you can just respond into the chat. Okay, good. So this is this is the dashboard. I was talking about. So what you have here, you have uh, different well bores, okay, which uh, which you can see. These are uh, the wells here: MIP three H, MIP five H, six H. You can look at their the perforations on each one of these uh, wells. You can look at the well logs, okay. So this basically shows the gamma rock on the MIP three H. So this is my MIP three H where I turned on the gamma ray log. You can look at that on the other wells too. There is a 3H vertical well, which you can look at the different uh, well logs, like uh, your density log or resistivity log or porosity log. These are also, you can change that and then you can look at the values here. You can go to different, every single one of these well logs, they have their own. And then you can go to the geothermal well. So in the geothermal well, again, we ran so many different well logs. You can look at the gamma ray. You can look at the uh, porosity log. So this is a gamma ray ran on the deep well. You can look at the different structures. So you can open the structures and see where they have been located basically top of the Marcellus shale, let's say if I'm interested to check on that. So this is basically where the Marcellus shale is located. And this is where basically the wells has been drilled to produce from the Marcellus shale. And then this uh, MIP1S, which is the geothermal well is passing through that. On the right hand side, you, what you can see is, uh, this is the, again, this is the aerial, view of these wells, you can look at the micro seismic events. So as we are, as we are drilling, as we are completing the wells and we are fracking, we can see how the micro seismic events are developing. These basically events are good to show us about the hydraulic fracture extensions, natural fracture behaviors. And uh, this is also again, uh, available for, for this study. Okay, let me just uh, go back to the the presentation. Can you guys see the the slides now, or should I change the? If somebody asks for me in the in the chat, can we see the geothermal uh, log? Okay, okay. So so that was the. Uh, one of the basics that uh, basic things that we work on to gather all that information, like all those micro seismic well logs, formation tops, perforations, everything, and bring it into the dashboard, which can be easily accessed by anybody. Like you just copy and paste that link that I just showed you in your browser, and you will be able to access to this. 
and you will be able to look at different data, look at how and start performing the analysis. So that was the first thing that we did. And then uh, again, if you remember, we said on the geothermal, the, the important thing is to come up with the temperature gradients, right? To make sure that the temperatures are, are good. And uh, for that purpose, we are uh, we have rep, we ran a couple of temperature logs, and as you can see, the temperature logs has been ran on different dates, on the June twenty second, June twenty fourth, and then in the August we ran, and we are planning to run more. And one of the outcomes of uh, this was that the well has been drilled to ten thousand three hundred eighty five. Uh, 10,500 feet, but we could, uh, using these geothermal gradients, we can extrapolate that to see what the temperature will be at 15,000 feet. And as you can see, the temperature gradients will change. So the more we waited, okay, the more we waited, we got higher temperature. The temperature was cooler, okay, at a shallower depth, and it becomes hotter at the deeper formation. So that was one of the observations. So, which is basically different than the logs that's been taken while drilling or few days after you complete the drilling. So basically what it says that all those uh, temperature gradients maps that's been generated, these are mostly generally generated uh, while people were drilling the wells. So, the formation and the well bore temperature has not reached to the uh, equilibrium condition. Therefore, most of the time, those temperatures were not the actual representation of the temperature gradient. So that's why we're saying that we needed to run multiple temperature logs at different times to be able to come up with that. The second observation uh, that we made was uh, by Dr. Carr, uh, mainly, on a change in the temperature gradient as a function of the geology. So this is the depth, right? So as we go deeper into the formation, you can clearly see that the slope of the temperature gradient will change. And this change has a direct relationship with the type of formation that we are dealing with, okay? So that was another, another uh, important observation that we made with this uh, with these logs, which is basically detailed here. And it shows that, you know, the, the temperature gradient is actually different in different formation, and it's different based on the, uh, based on different times of the uh, measurement. Uh, the other uh, thing that we are looking, we are looking in different well logs. So in this uh, case, uh, the loss has been, uh, the level log analysis has been done um, by WVU with the assistance with the Baker Hughes. Uh, the logs that we got was a dipole sonic log. We got the image logs and we got the mineralogical log using the flex. And uh, we also got a sidewall course that's been ran for the standard uh, analysis is XRD, XRF, SEM, thin sections, and they are currently under the triaxial test. So, uh, which basically is gonna give us the better information regarding the geomechanical properties of the uh, of these formations. So we looked at this. We looked at the surface. We first we found the best locations in terms of the capital expenditures where we can find that location to drill a well, and then we looked at the surface facilities to make sure that. Uh, how much heat, what kind of temperatures and the flow rates we need. And then we started investigating the actual reservoir. And the investigation was by simply collecting all the information from the adjacent wells, and then uh, using the information that we are getting from the uh, science well that we drill for the geothermal purposes, and then integrating all those in some sort of a reservoir, like a dashboard, 3D dashboard to be able to perform more analysis. We come up with the, uh, for the next step, we wanted to do the reservoir simulation, which basically is we wanted to see when we are injecting fluid, uh, cold water into the well bore, and then we are expecting this cold water to pass through the reservoir and being produced from the second well, how the pressure and temperature will change as we are injecting, 
what would be the impact of the injection rate and pressure on this heat transfer between the fluid and the between the reservoir rock and the fluid and how the temperature distribution will look like pressure distribution will, will look like how the stresses will impact this uh, behavior you have you have a hot rock what's the effect of temperature on the change in the stresses and then what's the effect of the pressure on the change in the stresses and obviously the change in the stress will result to change in the permeability of the formation or the fractures and then that will result in the flow rate that you can produce so for that purpose uh, we needed to build a reservoir model in this case we are using the cmg uh, stars which is basically from the computer group modeling uh, and the store module of the CMG is used for the process like uh, geothermal for the thermal recovery, anything involved temperature. And you wanted to keep track of the heat conduction, uh, heat diffusion. That's basically what you'd use. Use the one of the softwares that can be used is CMG store. So that's basically the commercial software that we are using. And uh, this software can also help us uh, with investigating reactions. One of the uh, major problems uh, in these hot dry rocks is the scaling, right? So when the fluid is getting into contact with the hot rock, what kind of reactions will happen? So for that, you need to have a very good understanding of the mineralogy of the formation. You should have a very good understanding of the water formation water and uh, the quality of that and the cations and anions involved in those, in that the solid materials uh, in, that uh, these brines or formation waters contain. And then knowing what kind of reactions, uh, what kind of reactions will, will happen and then how much of the scaling or precipitation you would get. So that's one of the things that we are interested to to investigate using this uh, CMG store. This is a 3D model, uh, fine grade models uh, developed for this study. As you can see, there have been two wells, one injection, one production. The wells has been uh, fracked by the bug and perf, hydraulic fracturing that we discussed last session. And uh, we tried to run the flow and look at the distributions. As I said, uh, the other important thing is that we are interested to find is the geochemical assessment and modeling. Okay. So again, you have a formation which is under the high temperature, high pressure, and then you are going to have a fluid getting through this system. This has been done by uh, Dr. Sharma in the geology in collaboration with NETL. And uh, I believe this is a setup that they have in the NETL National Energy Technology Laboratory where they're looking at these reactions between the injected fluid, fluid formation and the rock formation. And doing, completing all these, looking at the surface data, looking at the subsurface data, then the next step would be to perform the economic analysis, okay? And for the economic analysis, as we said, you are looking at the whole life cycle of the project. Here, basically, the, uh, the economic analysis is done for the 30 years uh, life cycle of this uh, geothermal well. And the calculations included the weighted average cost of capital and uh, the tax rate of 21%. And we included some production tax credit and investment tax credit for the calculations. And then uh, for the for the actual, again, as I said, this is basically a science well. The study that we did was based on the science well. But uh, after you make sure that the reservoir, the identified reservoir, has the enough temperature, and then it, the way that you design for this, uh, for this heat production, is such that you can respond to the demand of the heat for the university. Then the next phase of this project would be to actually go and drill injection and production well. 
So for that, we need to do detailed economic analysis of uh, what kind of uh, capital expenditures we are talking about. And that's, again, it really depends on how many well you need to drill to be able to accommodate the amount of temperature and the flow rate required for the heating and cooling of the university. So in, for that sense, uh, we have been looking at four different scenarios uh, and at each scenario, uh, the initial investment is different. For example, it's on $10 million, $20 million, $30 or $40 million. And for each case, we are looking at the different energy outcomes. And we are looking at the LCOE for every single one of these cases. So the initial investment is assumed to be variable. The operational cost and maintenance cost is variable, and the growth rate is assumed to be two percent. And then um, for thirty per, for the thirty years uh, life uh, span of the project with a discount rate of six percent. And then performing this uh, investigations, uh, what we come up with is the best case scenario, which will give you the lowest LCOE value of $22 uh, per megawatt hours is basically, uh, is this case where you spend $30 million and you're looking for 110 megawatt uh, hours of the energy with this operational and maintenance cost of uh, $300,000. And this basically turns out to be the best. And then the worst scenario was with the lower initial investment, which basically lead to LCOE value of $45 per megawatt hours. And uh, as we discussed before, there, there are a couple of, uh, couple of uh, parameters that we can look. LCOE, the level of levelized cost of energy was one of them. Uh, this is basically very similar to the IRR calculation, internal rate of return. And uh, it basically looks at the cost of producing an output. Okay. Uh, we can also look at the LACE. Okay, this is very similar to the opportunity cost. It looks at the cost avoided on average if another source were to be used in replace the produced uh, the same amount of uh, output. So it basically compares one technique with the best next alternative technique. And then if you look at both LACE to LCOE ratio over time, basically you wanted to look at something with the... Uh, ratio of greater than one. And then we have performed a comparison study with other uh, renewable sources and uh, like a battery, combustion turbine, hydroelectric, hydro solar. And it seems that the geothermal in this case would always be the you know, better option for the investment. And uh, that's that's the last slide uh, that I have for for this discussion. But uh, to recap the whole uh, four sessions of the discussion that we had so far uh, on session one, we started with the discussion of why we need to do this, uh, what is the importance of uh, going on the geothermal, and we showed that the main concerns come from the climate change and global warming. And we were we wanted to decrease the carbon footprint because uh, we showed that the carbon dioxide has a direct relationship with global warming. And then we said there are two ways of doing this, either using the carbon capture and sequestration or doing the energy transition to something less uh, carbon uh, incentive. And for those uh, energies, we, we looked at them, we looked at these factors like the LCOE and the capacity factor, and we figured out that for the amount of energy that's been required, uh, geothermal seems to be uh, one of the best options to go. And then that basically 
start the discussion of different types of geothermal systems. And then we discussed the four major types of uh, geothermal systems. We, we discussed the traditional or conventional geothermal systems. We looked at the closed loop geothermal systems where basically both shallow and deep closed loop geothermal systems. We look at the enhanced geothermal systems, exactly the same uh, project like the one that we have in Morgantown. And we looked at some, uh, again, uh, newer uh, technologies like uh, half and half proposed by Sage. And then what we did, we delve into the details of the Sage uh, geothermal system. And today we had an overview of what the uh, enhanced geothermal system at WVU will look like. And uh, with that, uh, I'll open the uh, session for the questions. And if you have any questions, please uh, leave that in the Q&A or the chat room, and I would be happy to answer that. So we have the uh, Ferdush uh, ask about the correlation between recorded bottom wall temperature or corrected bottom wall temperature. So I assume that uh, the question is the relationship between the temperature and the formation is the question. Uh, if that's the if that's the question, okay, yeah. So yeah, we we looked at we looked at both measured. Uh, there are the, when we when we run the logs, there are two different types of the measurements that you get. One would be the actual measurement uh, by the instrument, and one would be the calculated temperature. So we, we look at both, and then uh, there is a there is a few uh, degree of Fahrenheit difference between these two measurements. Uh, I believe we use the measured bottom hole temperature, and then uh, we looked at the correlation of that with the formation, but. Again, it's a, it's a matter of shift in the data, but again, the trend would be the same. Still, you will see different temperature gradients uh, measured, and uh, but you can you can perform the correction to that too, which basically makes the magnitude a little bit different because uh, you can do a correction for the uh, formation heat transfer between the formation and the fluid, and then through the casing and uh, your your instrument. Very good question. Okay, if you guys don't have any other question, uh, oh, okay, I would like to say, uh, it was a pleasure talking with you guys, and uh, I hope that we will be in touch. Uh, if you have any question regarding the project which is going here at uh, West Virginia or uh, anything regarding this topic, uh, Feel free to shoot me an email. You have my name, email address in the in the beginning of the presentations. I would be happy to help in any ways that I can. Thank you.